Okay, good evening, folks. Um, this is a meeting of the Marin Municipal Water District Board meeting for the night of June 21st, summer solstice. And uh, to get started, we'll do roll call on attendance. Director Bragman. Here. Director Gibson. Here. Director Kohler. And Vice President Schmidt. Here. Okay, next up, um, can we get a motion to adopt the agenda? Move the so agenda. Second. Okay, do we have any public comments on the agenda? On the agenda, uh, I have two. I have one for the agenda, Mr. James Krajewski. Go ahead, Mr. Krajewski. Uh, that's not for the agenda, thank you. Oh, okay, Sorry. thank you, sir, no worries. Okay, I have no public comment for the agenda. Okay, can we get a roll call vote? Director Gibson. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Director Bragman. Aye. And Vice President Schmidt. <clears throat> Aye. Okay, comments on items not on the agenda? Yes, now that we have a, a few. Mr. James Krajewski, then Ed Jamison. Go ahead, Mr. Krajewski. Uh, thank you. Uh, at a board meeting in April, Director Kohler claimed that the water board has never rationed water during her term on the board. I wasn't clear why she claimed this, but it seemed to have something to do with the definition of rationing that involved cutting off or limiting water supply. But of course, that is exactly what the district has done with various mandatory limits on water use. The rationing word was a apparently so problematic that it was to be removed from the slide presentation on which it occurred. This declaration caught my attention because having been subject to various mandated water use limits over the years, it seemed like such an Orwellian moment. We don't ration water, we just demand that you use water on various days and for various purposes. I've tried to find any source for the idea that many of the district's restrictions are not a form of rationing. I've been unable to find a definition that excludes these restrictions. One of the definitions cited on the blog of the Davis Center for Water, UC Davis Center for Watershed Services, specifically mentions restrictions on lawn watering and car washing as examples of urban water rationing. Over the past month, I've sent emails to Director Kohler and General Manager Hornstein with copies to Director Russell requesting clarification of the term rationing as used by Director Kohler and a source for the term. I have not received a response to my inquiry from Director Kohler or even an acknowledgement of the email. I did uh, receive a response from Mr. Hornstein, but it didn't speak specifically to the issue of the use of the term rationing at the board meeting, nor how the term is defined by the water district. I sent a follow-up inquiry and have not uh, had a response. Why should it be so difficult to get what should be a simple and easy answer? Either there is or there is not an accepted definition of rationing, and there is or is not a source for the definition. If this non-response, is this non-response considered acceptable and respectable treatment of customers? What is gained by those in charge leaving an issue such as this hanging without a response? At some point, being unresponsive to customers becomes a problem for all those involved in leadership. Do all of the directors agree that this is a way a public agency should treat customers? Does someone want to answer a simple question, or is it preferred to let this become part of the recording of each board meeting that will remain in the public domain? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Ed Jamison. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. I missed last Friday's operations meeting and I'd like to echo Larry Minicky's comments that our infrastructure has been inadequately maintained to the detriment of present ratepayers who are faced with prematurely replacing critical infrastructure that likely could have lasted many more years with proper maintenance. Last year's plan process identified the need to fix our infrastructure, which appears to have been badly neglected, perhaps for two or more decades but the board had no appetite for raising rates to address these needs. This year's plan process has once again identified the need to step up maintenance spending to avoid saddling the next two generations of Marin homeowners 
with replacement costs that could have been avoided with proper maintenance. As an example, replacing only seven miles a year of our over 900 miles of pipelines is pretty clearly inadequate, particularly with a couple hundred miles of leak prone cast iron pipelines that need to be replaced at an accelerated rate. And bond financing must be avoided for normal maintenance, repair and replacement activities. Such costs need to be covered by rate increases. To achieve supply security, we will be facing a bill of $200 million plus or minus for desal. And if we can't get desal in place before the next crisis, we will need a $100 million emergency pipeline with all its warts to East Bay mud. We may also need $100 million to raise Sula Jewel Dam. Our limited bonding capacity must be preserved for main major enhancements to our water security and for possible emergencies resulting from climate change. It would be financially irresponsible to pay for ongoing maintenance actions with bond issuances. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jamison. We have now three more com commenters, mm -hmm. Phil Sauter, Clayton Smith, and then Usurpator Anderson. Go ahead, Mr. Sauter. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, last Wednesday, there was a story on KCBS Evening News about Marin's free leak detection uh, service with uh, Christina Montanos and reporter Kenny Choi. Uh, and when it came back to the news anchors, they gave the district some really good press for this program. Uh, they also mentioned that the, um, the daily usage was 83 gallons per day in California and 40 gallons per day per person in uh, San Francisco. They didn't say what Marin was. I found a table of water use in Marin that says we use 20,000 acre feet a year. And there's another table that says we have 80,000 acre feet of storage, which suggests to me we have four years worth of um, water storage. But I heard a few meetings ago that we have only two and a half years worth of storage. I guess it could be sedimentation in our reservoirs, but it seemed like quite a difference. Um, if we do use 20,000 acre feet a year, that means we average 18 million gallons a day. I found another page that said we average 20 million gallons a day in May, so that's not off by much. That same page said we use 25 million gallons a day in May 2020, so I wondered if that means we're using 20% less water than two years ago. That would be encouraging if it means we're halfway to our 40% long-term goal, but I don't know what that big period is. I found another chart that says 75% of our water is used by single family and multifamily dwellings. If that means 15 million gallons a day is used by our 190,000 customers, that's 70, 79 gallons per day capita, per capita. That's about the same as California, but double San Francisco and 40% more than Santa Cruz. That same pie chart showed that about half of single family residential water use <laughs> is for irrigation. And I wondered how much of that could be conserved and what it would take for Marin to look more like Santa Cruz. I'd really like to make sense of all these numbers and I volunteered to analyze some long-term usage data like we did 10 mm -hmm. years ago when we uh, were dealing with the, the district's uh, need uh, for a 10 million gallon tank on White Hill and the data showed that we didn't need it. I think we have lessons to learn about trends in our water use over the past decade and how our various geographic areas compare with one another. I haven't yet got a response to that data request, but I'm still hopeful we can learn something useful. And finally, if we're going to achieve a 40% reduction, I think we make, need to make it really simple for folks, starting with how many gallons a day they're using now, how many gallons a day they need to be using five years from now, and what are the one or two things they can do to get there. So I'm going to suggest once again that we give away 50 flume devices in each of our nine gravity system areas and start making Marin the most water place in the country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Clayton Smith, please. Am I unmuted? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, just one thing about the last person speaking. Uh, Marin is... Um, not San Francisco. And uh, I hope that it never becomes San Francisco where all you see is concrete everywhere you walk, except for a very few places. And it just looks like a, it's one of the reasons I would 
not want to live in San Francisco. It just looks awful to me to be there. Um, I'm I wanted to bring up the issue uh, concerning the replacement that's going on with the water pipe on East Blythdale. And uh, I hope that what I've experienced is something that bringing to your attention perhaps uh, might help you in the future with other jurisdictions and other areas uh, that are highly trafficked that you're going to be replacing pipes in. The lack of traffic management that has occurred on uh, Miller Avenue, where all the traffic from East that otherwise was going down East Blythdale. Uh, this lack of traffic management, particularly at the 2 a.m. club uh, on Miller Avenue is just unconscionable. It is, it just, I, I really, every time I have and particularly when the high school was in session, just the sheer stupidity of not having hired someone to direct traffic at that intersection. I mean, within your budgets, there must have been some money available to hire an off-duty policeman or retired cop who wanted to earn some extra bucks to actually help traffic flow there instead of having it stacked all the way back up into downtown Mill Valley. You also should have worked with the city council of Mill Valley to take that and close the bike lane and parking so we could have had two lanes of traffic going down Miller Avenue as it was before they did this bike lane. This would have allowed all of the people that are backed up there to actually make it through 2 a.m. club and get on the way. You also needed to have a little bit of traffic supervision uh, going on over at Camino Alto and East Blythdale for the people trying to get out of town. And I, with where, when you go and do some more uh, repairs of this sort, will you please think kindly on those of us who are driving and rely on those roadways that you're tearing up and the diversion of traffic to get from one place to another. You've almost killed all the businesses in downtown Mill Valley. I hope you, um, it's not too late. Anyways, thank you. Thank you, sir. And our last speak commenter is user Peter Anderson or user Peter Anderson. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to first of all, thank Don Wick and the Marin County Fire Crews for, for putting out the fire at Von Tempe Lake last Thursday. I was really impressed. Um, my partner, Christine, and I were on the Von Tempe Trail Thursday at 9.30, 100 feet from the ignition point when we heard a cry for help and saw a plume of smoke. I ran to the top of a small knoll and saw a man lying face down, surrounded by burning grass and leaves. His clothes were on fire. I was able to smother the flames with my shirt, and then I was able to help him get up and walk very slowly to the trailhead as the fire exploded behind us. If any wind had been blowing, Away from the lake, the fire would have cut, raced 300 feet through a tender dry meadow to the heavily forced ridge top. We got a break, a huge break. I tried to call for help, but my phone said no service. Should I have dialed 911? If so, this information needs to be on signs next to the signs that say no smoking, automatic $1,000 fine. According to my camera, the fire exploded into view at 9.30. Marin County fire crews arrived in full strength with tools and fire hoses at 10.30. As you know better than most, we are at war with fire throughout the West. It's hot. It was 107 today at our house in Fairfax. Um, some ideas that have surfaced in the last few days. So one, we need more signage. Two, we need strict enforcement with fines. We need a restored ranger staff. You have a skeleton crew reduced by almost half over many years. Some days there's only one ranger on duty and currently two are on sick leave. We would like to know who mans the fire tower on Mount Tam and when does that include the state and national park people? Um, there are questions coming in on next door about cell phone service. Some say it works, some say it doesn't work in the, in the water district. 
MMWD has used volunteers effectively for so many different causes. We need fire watchers, we need someone at the entry booth, and we need to continue this discussion because we are all at risk now and we need to work together. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. One more, uh, we have one more speaker, Valerie. Go ahead, Valerie. Go ahead. Uh, Valerie. Okay, we'll just come back to uh, Valerie um, later. Okay, go ahead. No more further commenters. Can I just jump in super fast? I know we can't um, engage with the uh, you know, because of uh, we can't engage with the issues that that come up, but I um I do want to address the the um, Mr. Anderson's comments because the board um, has received a lot of um, letters about that, and I wanted to thank him in particular for his, which I read with great interest. Um, and I just want to um, say that I think this issue needs to be agendized very very soon. Um, I really agree that um, we need to do far more to ensure that the watershed is. Um, you know, is protected and obviously we're heading into fire season. And um, I just wanna say that um, speaking for myself, I, I really agree with the commenters, um, that, you know, who have written to us and sent emails um, about the situation this weekend. It's very serious. And it's something I hope that the staff can take up um, very, very soon. Great. Thank you. So um, I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in because I had planned on, on making uh, a comment about it. I actually spoke to Ben about um, commenting uh, as part of the general man manager's report, but just to um, sort of summarize my, uh, my views, we've had three fires in the watershed this month. We had a fire on June 1st, we had a fire on June 16th, and we had a small fire today. During the June 1st fire, Ranger Brett got up there, was at the Meadow Club. Uh, he managed to keep the fire under control until Marin Fire came, but he mentioned in his report that his water ran out just as two fire engines arrived on the scene. Peter, I met with over the weekend. I saw some 50 photos of the scene at Bon Tempe, including the fire victim who appeared to have suffered um, uh, second degree burns over his uh, right leg. His entire pant leg had been burned off his body. Um, and, you know, he was literally on fire until Peter came up and put the fire out with his Pendleton. And today we had a small fire. So there's a few things uh, I want to, I agree with Peter, and I just want to put out sort of a, a, a checklist for us to consider a few suggestions. One, and this probably fits in with tonight's closed session, we need to get a comprehensive study of cell coverage on Mount Tam. And we need to see whether there's any um, opportunity to get one of our cell providers to provide uh, 911 coverage for the entire mountain if there's and to determine whether there's any dead zones. Second, we need to find out if the fire watchtower is staffed 24 seven. So if not, can we work with our watershed partner agencies to make sure it's, it's staffed 24 seven at least during the ever lengthening fire season. Third thing, uh, and this is something I've mentioned in passing, I think we need to purchase a wildland truck which has greater um, water capacity. Right now, the water capacity for our four wheel drive is 100 gallons. And I think we need a larger capacity vehicle with a 500 gallon tank. Um, and I think we should, you know, as our response becomes more important to stop spread, I think we have to be prepared to control the fire for a longer period of time. Next, 
as Peter mentioned, forming a citizen's fire reporting group that could be instructed how to report a fire in a timely way with their cell phones, maybe putting up some signs, maybe letting people know that if they see smoke, they need to call 911. Uh, next, whether PG&E is sharing its high tech eye in the sky data with us routinely. Um, are, they, are we getting that data on a routine basis? Is that being sent to our dispatch communication center? Um, the last thing I wanna mention is there's also concerns being raised in Fairfax about the adequacy of fire flow by the Children's Center. So that situation is um, still in uh, under study by the district. The district I think has handled it very well. We're gonna be doing some retesting out at the school. But the point is we are reminded of the importance of preparation and vigilance. And I think these three things, these three fires are a wake up call for us and they should be used you know, to, move, to move fire safety to the top of our agenda. So I wanna second uh, Cynthia's suggestion that we get this agendized without delay. Good comments, Larry. I know uh, we're, we're, we're way over what we should be, but I'm just going to agree with every single one of your suggestions. <laughs> Good. Um, it seems like they can Thank solve you. the water problem with a water boy. Just tow a little trailer behind them to, to get a quicker solution than buying another truck. Just FYI. Okay, so director's announcements. Um, to, uh, President Russell, can I try to get Valerie to make her comment if I can get her on? Um, or do you want to go ahead and just proceed? No, let's just go. Okay, Valerie. She, we'll, we'll, is she on? Yeah, she's on. Valerie, she's unmuted. Or it says here that she's unmuted. All right, never mind. Never mind. Let I go. Just go ahead. Director's announcements. Um, right, Larry, was that your own Cynthia? Yeah, I'll just jump in. Um, I was at the American Water Works Association's um, ACE conference last week. I think there were some MMWD, well, I certainly saw Director Russell there, and I think there were some other MMWD folks there who I did not see, but um, it was good to be back in person. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to mention it that um, ACE and AWA, which is the premier, uh, I think, water um, association in the country, um, and I was there to, um, uh, to talk specifically about merging leaders and about um, you know, transformation in the water space around innovation, but it was great to see um, AWA moving in that direction. And in particular, um, it's, uh, it's, it's um, uh, focus on this next generation of leaders and uh, very exciting times to be working there. So I just wanted to mention that, um, that I was there, that MMD was there and um, things are getting a little bit back to normal. Good, yes, you gave a, Cynthia gave a great talk in one of the sessions on that transition issue. Uh, Larry? Uh, I think I've spoken my piece for, for right now. That's okay. cool. Jack? Jack? You're muted, Jack. Sorry, no, I'm good. Okay, Monty? No, nothing new to add. Uh, the great comments already about fire was where I was gonna go. Okay, um, and as Cynthia said, we were at the American Water Works meeting last week in San Antonio. Uh, it was a very effective meeting. Um, very warm there. Okay, uh, Ben, any director, general managers? Um, it, <clears throat> President Russell, I'll just follow up on the comments with the fire and note that we will um, kind of get a lessons learned and talk about at an upcoming meeting um th these suggestions and as well as other ideas i've heard and that staff has developed as well i did want to note that um <clears throat> just appreciation for our rangers <clears throat> who did respond i i have heard from a number of folks that it was an excellent response very competent and not just our staff but also our fellow agencies certainly including county fire but of course that doesn't mean we can't do better and we can't take this wake up moment. And I think that's well characterized as an opportunity and we'll be doing that. Could, could Ben, could I just throw in one comment because I don't want it to be, to be misinterpreted. 
the response by our staff and Marin Fire was praise. The, the right. issue was the lag time between ignition and when the call was made to get the response. Once the call was made, it was timely. So the lag time is between ignition and call. But you know, Peter Anderson specifically had a lot of praise, particularly for Chief Ranger Wick, his ability to respond and keep things under control to calm the victim and take care of business. So good. That's I, great. I to make that clear. And your comments, Larry, about the cell phone coverage are excellent. That's a great idea. You know, it's cell phone is line of sight. So there's going to be probably a fair number of dead spots just by that consequence. Understood, understood yeah. So, but great comments. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Do you mean Roll the call? consent? Do I need what? Do you mean the consent calendar? Uh, well, either way, it doesn't matter which order we do them in. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, Roll call. Director well, I guess the minutes are on the consent calendar. I, I don't think I've ever seen that before. So let's do the consent calendar. Can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? Move. Move. Second. Roll call. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Vice President Schmidt. Aye. Director Bragman. Aye. And President Russell. Aye. Okay, item six, renewal of annual insurance policies. And good evening, directors. Uh, my name is Brett Uppendahl. I'm the finance director here from Marin Water. Uh, tonight, we're bringing you an item to renew our annual insurance policies. Uh, this does cover our all-risk property insurance, our excess liability insurance, uh, excess workers' comp, as well as our auto, our cyber, our pollution, and our crime insurance policies. Um, as we do every year, these policies are due for renewal on July 1st. Um, and the packet you have before you uh, includes a staff report uh, summarizing uh, the changes from last year, um, as well as a one page summary comparing the costs of each policy um, and some of the more pertinent facts to last year's policies. Um, and then the third, the third attachment there is the full presentation from our partners at Alliant uh, that includes a more comprehensive summary of each proposal. And then before I get into the details here today, I did wanna thank staff uh, and our partners at Alliant uh, for all of their work in getting to this point. Uh, we bring this item to your board each year, as I mentioned, uh, but there is a lot of work done behind the scenes uh, in terms of information gathering. And I know Alliant does a lot of work in terms of scoping the proposals and finding us uh, the best deal we can get out there. Uh, that's getting tougher and tougher each year as you'll read through this report. Um, but I did wanna specifically on our side, uh, thank Shelly Riley, who is our acting finance manager, as well as, as, well as Cheryl Howitt, who is our uh, finance analyst. Uh, Molly McLean and Jared Mills from General Counsel's office. Um, and then today here we have from Alliance, Seth Cole, who is the Senior Vice President. Um, we also worked closely with Matt McGannis and uh, Fred Godfrey. So I wanna thank you for all of your work getting to this point. And so I'll give your board a high level overview here today. Uh, we do have, like I mentioned, Seth here uh, and his team to help answer any of the detailed questions you may have. Uh, but to kind of get down to it, uh, the total cost uh, that we are uh, anticipating for this year's proposal is not to exceed $1,367,137. Uh, that is an increase of 195000 compared to last year. Uh, that equates to a 17% increase. Uh, we did see cost increases in nearly every category, in fact, all but one. Uh, and the largest increases that you'll see today are in our excess liability and in our property insurance. Uh, this does continue a multi-year trend of increasing costs for insurance uh, here across the state and, uh, and across the nation as well. Uh, it's my understanding this comes from an increased frequency and severity in excess liability suits, uh, uh, basically meaning that claim settlements are coming in higher and higher each year. Um, and also for property insurance, uh, 2021 was the fourth worst loss year ever for the insurance industry. Uh, and that includes both the effects of the fire season as well as the increasing costs for replacement and for materials. So in terms of our specific uh, proposals here today, uh, our, our liability coverage uh, totals $25 million. 
uh, uh, that is in three different layers. Uh, the cost to the district here is seven hundred and fifty-two thousand um, dollars. That is an increase of about one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars from last year, or nineteen percent. Um, similarly, our property insurance um, totals about four hundred and twenty-four thousand um, dollars. It's increasing by seventeen percent this year. Um, the, the net impact there is about sixty-two thousand dollars. Um, and that does cover over $463 million in insured value here across the district. Uh, the other components of our insurance por portfolio are much smaller. Uh, those include workers' compensation, our auto, uh, our cyber uh, pollution, and our crime policies. Combined, those categories um, have a total cost of $190,000. Uh, that's an increase of only $15,000 or 8%, so a much smaller <laughs> increase. Still a big percentage, but smaller than the uh, liability and property insurance coverages. So taken all together, uh, again, as I mentioned at the top, our total costs this year are estimated not to exceed uh, $1.3 million or 1367. Um, that's a 17% increase uh, compared to the prior year. And in just bottom line dollars, that's an increase of $195,000. Uh, so that concludes my kind of high level summary. Uh, we do have, have, as I mentioned, Seth Cole here from Alliant. So I invite him to offer any comments or clarifications to my overview. And we are both here to answer any questions that your board may have. Hi everyone, Thank you, thanks. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me and Brett, you did an excellent job providing an overview. I couldn't have done it any better, so thank you. Uh, do wanna show appreciation to uh, staff at uh, the district to, it's a lot of work come renewal time, a lot of data gathering, pulling together a lot of information. So it's very helpful for us. And it's a great collaboration between uh, Alliant and district staff to, to pull the renewals off. Um, as Brett had mentioned, and you guys have seen the past couple of years, we've talked to you about the, you know, the, the difficult uh, market conditions. We're in a very challenging insurance environment. Uh, we are starting to see some moderation in the market. So we're hopeful that, you know, some of these rate increases and changes that we've seen the past couple of years are going to start to level off. Um, and, and uh, you know, to echo some of the things Brett said, you know, some of, a lot of what's actually driving these uh, significant changes in the market the past couple of years, it's really driven by claims that the insurance industry is paying. Um, this, you know, single largest category of claims the industry pays are these natural catastrophe losses, uh, wildfire was mentioned, tornadoes, hurricanes, flooding, uh, things of, of that nature that are impacting the market. Um, and just by uh, example, uh, 2021, it's expected that the insurance industry will pay somewhere around $112 billion um, in natural catastrophe losses. So that's a lot of what's driving, and particularly in California, it's wildfire. Um, that's a major concern for underwriters, and that's why we're seeing the reaction that we're seeing in the market. On the liability side, it's this notion of social inflation, Brett hit on it. It's where um, you know claims are costing a lot more to settle. Uh, there's a lot more litigated uh, claims, which is driving up costs when they get to the courts, juries, unfortunately, tend to, we've all read the headlines of these significant jury settlements or jury verdicts, excuse me, in large settlements, which um, has kind of knocked the insurers back on their heels mm -hmm. and they're reacting by increasing uh, rates. Uh, but overall, um, we believe that while no one's happy about uh, premium and rate increase, uh, we do believe that, you know, you have a solid insurance program and this was, you know, a, a relatively good outcome in this, in the current insurance market conditions. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, anyone has. Uh, I, I have a question, uh, Seth, I guess of you. Um, sure. uh, you've been, Alliance been with us a, a while. How many years has Alliance uh, been our carrier? I will say, um, as your insurance broker, this is either our third or fourth renewal season. I think it might be our third uh, renewal with you. So it's been a, a few years. Okay. And I guess one for Brett. Um, I know we have pockets of self-insured categories um, and levels of self-insured. Where do we stand? Can you give a, a summary of that? I mean, I think each policy or each you know level layer of this policy has its own self-insured or deductible amount. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we have any significant changes from the prior year on that. Uh, they are included in your packet in the in the first attachment there um, on the SIR deductible column. Um, I think. And generally speaking, like I said, there's no major changes from the prior year in those amounts, um, and so we we didn't we didn't really look into making any changes on those. I think there were some adjustments two to three years ago uh, in trying to get the right size between our our deductibles and, and the premium costs. 
but I think we felt like we made the right balance there last year. And so for the most part, these are the same levels. Okay, good, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead, Larry. Wow. So, uh, hey, Seth, um, there's a, a rating agency called ISO, which rates uh, fire insurance rates for different communities. And um, I'm wondering, does that play into how these rates are calculated for Marin Water? I, I, I had always understood Marin had a pretty good ISO rating uh, because of our infrastructure of uh, fire lines and uh, fire flow. So I'm just wondering, you know, do, do the policies that we're shopping take our ISO ratings into account, maybe discount it because of that? Yeah, and that's a really good question. And generally, those ISO ratings are more geared towards um, like uh, personal insurance, homeowners insurance, or um, or, or small businesses. Um, are, are that's generally geared toward and factored in. It's less so when you get to uh, like uh, schedules like you guys have. As Brett mentioned, you got some four hundred and sixty million dollars in insured values. Um, and the, so, what the commercial um, insurance industry is really focusing on in California right now is wildfire scores. Um, there's a, a couple of organizations that, that uh, measure that and provide wildfire scores and largely a, a group, uh, an organization called CoreLogic. Uh, most insurance companies are relying on CoreLogic's wildfire scores. Um, and what they do is essentially it's one to 100. Um, anything over 70, 75 is considered pretty high risk wildfire score and the closer you get to 100, the higher your wildfire score is. Um, the district has two pretty large facilities in uh, what are considered very high wildfire areas. Um, and so that poses a little bit of a challenge in the market, the two treatment facilities. Um, and so that, you know, we balance that. So you do absolutely have some facilities that are well protected and insulated from wildfire risk. And then you have a couple of facilities, which is significant. I think it's in excess of $200 million in values that are at what is considered a high wildfire risk. Right. We have also hardened those facilities in the last couple of years. So does anybody go out and take a look at it and actually yeah. get this past year, you actually had uh, uh, surveyors, uh, inspectors from the, the insurance companies actually went out there uh, this year. Um, and so they do take that into consideration. Absolutely. And, and do they give us a list of improvements they would suggest? Yeah, I'll go back and look. Generally, they will make recommendations if they feel like they're if they have concerns, they'll make recommendations um, and I'll go back and look. Uh, sometimes they indicate that, hey, we went out there and we have no recommendations, which means you're doing an excellent job. Right. Um, and I'll go back and look. we can go back and look at those. Yeah, because that, they're primarily reinforced concrete structures, you know, which aren't going to burn. Although yeah. we did just plug in the multimillion dollar mm -hmm. diesel generators out there. Yeah, we uh, we 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 had uh, made that argument, and then there was the Paradise Fire, right. and uh, <laughs> that the, the <laughs> that argument didn't hold as much water. No pun intended. Could we, um, could Seth? Could we, um, or would you share the core logic score for our agency with us? Yeah, it's by location. Um, but yeah, I, we can absolutely share that information uh, with you. And it's not like agency wide, it's actually very specific to each address and location. Okay, I think it'd be interesting to take a look at that and see if there's any improvements or, or you know, hardening that we could do. And then the other thing I wanted to ask about is um, as far as um, Marin Waters claim, claims history, um, where are we in the spectrum of claims history? It seems to me we've got a pretty good claims history. Is that taken into account? Absolutely. Claims are um, claims are heavily factored into the underwriting process and the premiums that you pay. And uh, the district has excellent, knock on wood, excellent uh, claims history, and that is definitely factored in uh, to your ability. Um, you know, we do have clients, unfortunately, that, that don't have uh, great claims history. And generally, that means even higher premiums and, and higher self-insured retentions or deductibles. So you guys do have excellent claims history. Is that uh, hold true for workman's compensation as well? 
Yeah, you guys have relatively good on the workers' compensation as well. You don't have anything that's reached the excess, which is fantastic, right? right. Um, but you have activity, you have normal activity that you expect, right? People are doing manual labor. They're going right. to get injured right. just in the course of doing, you know, their job. So, uh, yeah, I'd really appreciate if we could get the core logic and then uh, the inspection reports at uh, Larry Russell. Uh, yeah, I, I made a couple of notes. Um, we'll, we'll circle back to Brett and his team. Thank cool. you very much. Thanks for answering the questions. Thank you. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we, per our previous conversation, we are very interested in, in fire prevention. And if there are, is a, a part, if there is an aspect of our premiums that are going up that we can address or mitigate or reduce likely future increases through increased fire preparedness, I think it'd be really helpful and good information for us to be able to see where that nexus is. Um, for fire protection as well as reduce costs. Yeah, it seems a little incredible to me that a, a water treatment plant can catch on fire. I suppose it's possible, but it seems a little far-fetched. Uh, any other comments? Uh, public comment? Yes, Mr. Larry Minikis. Go ahead, Mr. Minikis. Well, first, I'm gonna to comment to the previous item uh, which is, um, the question is, why wasn't there any fire spotters, uh, any scopes or anything on the watershed or on the mountains around, like Mount Barnaby that had picked up on this sooner? Um, that, that's a, particularly with, with the dry condition, conditions we're facing. And then uh, to, to what Seth just presented, um, and there's a $200 million liability to facilities. I wonder if those facilities also include our reservoirs when you speak about, I'm, I'm wondering what is being looked at. And I'd also like to add to that, this would be very valuable for the public to also uh, be able to um, have access to this information. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. There are no further, oh, actually, Mr. Clayton Smith. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. I'm curious how the insurance is uh, allocated. Is it a part of the fixed part of our bill or is it somehow or another integrated in with the uh, variable part of the uh, bill that we pay? And what that last person uh, just spoke about um, just suddenly made me think of uh, the insurance on the dam up at Alpine Lake. How well insured is that? And um, given this wildfire risk, what is the risk uh, associated with that, given all the timber that's nearby? Those are questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay. okay. Uh, we do have, uh, let's see if we can get Valerie. Valerie, you're unmuted, ma'am. You should be able to speak. Uh, ben, do you have any comments on that, where the insurance is built? I assume it goes into the regular rate structure. Yeah, offhand, I, I'm not sure if it's on the schedule for fixed fees or from water sales. We, we can look into that. Okay. All righty. Well, this is an approval item. So I need a motion in a second. Uh, move approval. Second. Okay. Roll call. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Vice President Schmidt. Aye. Director Bragman. Aye. And President Russell. Aye. Okay. Item seven, professional services agreement. Yep. Good evening, directors. Crystal Yesman, Director of Engineering. I'm going to pass this over to Zach Talbot, who's going to present, give you a presentation on this item. Hi, good evening. I'm going to share my screen and we've got a PowerPoint to go through this evening. Are you guys seeing the full slide? Not yet. Not yet. Not presentation. Oh, hang on. Now we got it. 
How you got it? Yeah, it's good. Okay. So let's see. My name is Zach Talbot. I'm an associate engineer with Marin Water, and tonight we'll be discussing the Castania Pump Station Phase Two. Uh, first, we'll be going over a little background of Castania Pump Station, uh, the history, overview of the Phase One improvements, our Phase Two scope of work our phase two request for proposal, our consultant selection and our schedule. And then finally, our recommendation to move forward with design. And just to get everyone orientated here, uh, Castania pump station is shown to the right here. It's sandwiched between Castania road and highway 101. Uh, north is up on the photograph and south is down. So it's, on the, it's near the southbound lane of highway 101 as you're entering into Petaluma from the south. See. So it was Castania Pump Station was constructed in 1977 by MMWD. But we owned and operated it from 1977 to 1999. Uh, MMWD transferred ownership to Sonoma County Water Agency in 1999, and it was decommissioned in 2015 with the uh, realignment of the North Marin Aqueduct uh, that was done by the North Marin uh, Water Agency. Uh, this year, MMWD reacquired ownership and recommissioned in February of 2022 the Castania Pump Station, which has allowed us now to add pressure to the North Marin Aqueduct and increase our flows. So this is kind of an overview of what we were able to accomplish in the phase one improvements. And I'll uh, get together a little laser pointer here and kind of show you what's going on. So here is US 101. Uh, south, roughly, and then up here is Castania Road, and this outline here is the pump station. So the majority of the improvements which was done in phase one was to reconnect Castania Pump Station to the North Marin Aqueduct. So as you can see here, this bolded uh, pipeline here from a plan view, this is a bird's eye view, was reconnected back into the North Marin Aqueduct, which now runs underneath US 101 previously. It went this way and went along Castania Road, but when they realigned everything with the, with the 101 project, we, we were disconnected. And then with this phase one, we reconnected everything. And we've been testing operationally the capacity of Castania Pump Station since we reconnected everything in the winter of this year. And our increased flow went from 15 million gallons a day to 22.9 million gallons a day. So this slide is showing our available uh, flow through the North, North Marin Aqueduct with and without Castania Pump Station. Um, the, the flow, as I mentioned in the last slide, is roughly 22.9 million gallons per day with Castania running. Uh, previously, it was 15 million gallons per day uh, via gravity. So North Marin demands, and this is just a snapshot, uh, on any given day here in the spring of 2022. North Marin demands are roughly 11 million gallons per day. So our, at our district was receiving roughly 4 million gallons per day uh, before we reconnected and, and started up Castania again. So we've been seeing an increase of roughly 190% in flow when we run uh, Castania pump station. So now we can, uh, we've been measuring roughly 11.9 million gallons per day uh, coming into Ignacio with, with us running Castania Pump Station, which is a significant increase. So now I'll go into the phase two scope of work. And the majority of the work will, will revolve around replacing the existing electrical equipment with new switch gear and variable frequency drives. Uh, this switch gear was installed in 1977 along with the pump station. Um, it is roughly 45 years old and it is it is obsolete. It, it has uh, direct across the line soft starters, which power the pumps at full speed and do not allow any operational control. This, this scope of work will replace this, this switch gear or motor control center with uh, new variable frequency drives or otherwise known as VFDs. And VFDs are important because it allows our, our operation staff to control the flow through the pump station. And, and they can do that by slowing down the motor speed. Um, a good way to think about a VFD is similar to say a, a, light, a light dimmer switch at your home. So a standard light switch, 
you know, you could turn it off and on and all you get is full light power. Um, with VFDs, it's similar to a dimmer switch where you can control the, the flow and, and say, and you lower the flow and save energy costs and, and give us more operational flexibility. And VFDs are now industry standard and, and they've become, uh, they've become kind of the standard in which you, you know, you install into, into new pump stations. So the next scope of work is structural and architectural. So we would like to replace the pump station roof. Uh, as you can see in the slide, and I'll use the pointer again, um, this, this is a profile view of the pump room. So this back room here is the electrical room, and this is the pump room. It actually sits below grade and sits into this hillside and is a full story below grade. And it has a living roof, which was installed originally in 1977, and it's tied into this hillside. And the roof has, uh, you know, held up fairly well, but it is now leaking. And you can see um, here on this photo to the right, you can see the sheen off the light here. And this is actually standing water in the pump station. And we would like to address some of the flooding issues we have in the pump station by uh, replacing the roof. And, um, and also along with our architectural scope, we're, we're gonna install a, a new perimeter fencing um, along the, the pump station's uh, property boundaries. Uh, the last scope of work is to install a surge anticipator valve. This new surge anticipator valve will be installed uh, upstream of Ignacio Pump Station in Novato. This was called out in the phase one scope of work by the surge uh, analysis, which was provided by Corolo. Um, one of the things that we want to do is protect our infrastructure against sudden surge events. And the diagram to the right is kind of a, a truncated view of, of what these surge anticipator valves will do. So uh, the pump called out there is similar to say their Castania. And so when you lose power at a pump station, there can be transient waves uh, pressure going through our pump, to our uh, pipelines. And the surge anticipator valve uses a pressure sensing line and will anticipate, if you will, this surge in water flow from the abrupt stop of the pumps. And, It'll allow water to discharge into the atmosphere and protect all of our infrastructure. So we would like to install a new surge anticipator valve just upstream of Ignacio for, um, for these types of surge events. So now I'll go into our request for proposal process. Castania pump station phase two uh, work involves civil, electrical controls and mechanical engineering work. Because the scope was so broad, we felt that we needed to reach out to consultants that had specialized uh, pump station rehabilitation design teams in-house who kind of do this stuff for a living. And we issued our RFP to six different firms at the end of April. Five weeks later, we received three proposals. And these were the proposals that we, uh, we were evaluating uh, against each other. So who the were the proposals from, Zach? I'm sorry? Who were the proposals from? We received proposals from Corolla, Hazen and Sawyer, and Hydroscience. Thanks. No problem. So the district uh, created a review committee, which involved both engineering and operations, and we evaluated the, the three proposals. And our evaluation, our evaluation criteria were based on project understanding, uh, their project team, their approach to how they would like to solve the problems that we presented in the proposal, uh, their schedule, their qualifications and experience, and the overall budget. When reviewing the three uh, proposals, Hazen and Sawyer uh, rose to the top because we felt that they had the best project approach and uh, the most qualifications and experience of the, of the three uh, proposals that we received. So now we'll go over the the project schedule. So we're looking to execute the agreement this evening with a notice of award this week. Uh, we're gonna do a design kickoff meeting in early July and that'll start the, the phase two design phase which will go from July through the end of October. Uh, we're planning to do construction next summer. So we'll advertise for construction in May, award a contract in June and have construction start in July which is actually an optimum time to start a project like this because we're not 
actually allowed to run Castani pump station in the summer because of the, the flow limitation. So having Castani pump station uh, kind of being rehabilitated in the summertime is, is ideal for this project. And then we'd like to complete the construction uh, in the fall of 23, October is, is kind of where we're targeting. So that way we can have a fully operational pump station going into the winter months. Mm -hmm. So um, our recommendation is to move forward with Hazen and Sawyer. Uh, they really put together the best proposal. They had a great project understanding. They met out, out in the field with uh, Alex and myself and we, they went over the scope in detail with us and asked a lot of really good questions. And they even had a, a follow-up meeting with us in operations uh, to kind of go over all the fine details and really understand what we were looking for out of this project. Um, that coupled with, of course, their, their project team's experience and qualifications really allowed their proposal to rise to the top. Um, and their budget was right in the middle between the three proposals. It wasn't the highest, it wasn't the lowest, it was right in the middle. Um, so we're asking that the, the board um, allow the district, uh, excuse me, district staff recommends to execute the agreement with Hayes and Sawyer for the second phase of work and ask that they um, uh, approve the general manager to execute the contract. And with that, a question, board. Zach, yeah. how, large yeah. is there, how large is the Hazen office in San Francisco? Um, that's a good question. It's, it's quite large uh, from what I gathered. I, I don't have a number for you. I'm sorry. Because, I, you know, we haven't ever used them to my knowledge. It's a great firm, but I think of them more as an East Coast firm. Yeah, West Coast so, firm. yeah, so that was something we had asked was where all their, um, where all their engineers were located and they were all locally within the Bay Area. The project managers are in San Francisco and okay. the electrical engineers in the East Bay. And we asked them multiple times if they would be willing to come out at different phases of the design uh, process to take a look and talk through things with our operations staff. And they were very comfortable with that considering their locality. Okay, the other thing I don't understand is, you know, we're in a bit of a budget crunch uh, it doesn't seem like this project needs to be done now, just as a comment. And things like that surge valve, the blow off, you could, we could put the blow off in on the existing system, yes. We don't need an engineer to redesign what Carollo already did well, for Carollo, that particular one. Yeah, Carollo pointed out that we needed one, but um, they didn't, they didn't uh, locate one, if you will, because we'll, we'll have to locate a location and figure out what to sure. do with the surge of water when, when it does disappear. Sure. So there, there are sure. some details, but yeah. I think Zach, Zach, will this have any impact on the quantity of water we're able to, to take? Um, from, in terms of maximum water, no. They will, you know, we're kind of set by our pump size and our, our, uh, our motor. What it'll do is allow us to control operationally the flow of water um, to meet system demands both for you know, North Marin water and ourselves, depending on, on what is required at that time. So right now we could only go full bore 100%, and these right. DFDs will allow us to control flow depending on what's, uh, what we're you know, looking for and what North Marin's looking for. Okay. Larry makes an interesting point about the budget consideration. I, I was assuming that most of this was gonna be paid for out of capital. Um, I mean, the front is really on the operating side. Can you break that down for us? Sorry, can you say that again? Isn't this being paid for primarily out of our capital budget as opposed to operating? The crunch is really on the operating side. Um, Correct, Director Kohler, it is coming from our capital budget. Okay, so I, I just want a response to Larry's point about the budget situation. <clears throat> I mean, money is money, but I mean that the, the capital budget is for this kind of infrastructure investment. So it's not, you're not putting the same kind of strain on operating dollars. No, that's true, Cynthia, but I, I'm not aware of this project being in the capital improvement budget. It wasn't the last time I remember it being discussed. So it's being put in on top of whatever we already have. Crystal, do you want to... Fine. Did I misunderstand you, Crystal? Didn't you say this was coming out of capital? <clears throat> yeah, we did have it in the CIP update that we gave to the board at the finance committee meeting in May. It was one of the projects for the coming fiscal year that we had identified. So the bottom line is it is not going to impact our fiscal crunch with, with regard to the operating budget. That's correct. And, and if I could, Director Russell, um, 
a well, one reason we did make room for it in the CIP uh, in terms of it being a priority is it gives us redundancy, um, right? To have a second pump. Um, we felt that's critical to be able to ensure that we'd be able to get a Sonoma supply when we need it. And we don't have just a single point of failure with the one pump. Mm -hmm. That's fair. So, so Zach, is are the pumps operational now, or at least we have one pump that's operational now? Yeah, so we've been able to run both pumps. However, um, one of the pumps has vibrational issues and we've decided, you know, for testing purposes to, to not operate that. But pump number two is, has been, we've been running and testing that one uh, primarily through these past few months. And so are they both gonna get replaced with the project? Um, no, the project is mostly going to replace a lot of the electrical equipment for, for these pumps. I see. So the pumps themselves will remain. It's just the control C correct. mechanism. And then, I mean, it's kind of a silly question, but I assume um, you guys are going to have remote capability to control the VRDs or the VFDs remotely? Yes, correct. And then last question. we. Um, did we make an agreement to, to use Sonoma Clean Energy for this project? We did, we confirmed once we got ownership that we switched it over to the green. So we're, Sonoma. Using, we're using low carbon uh, power to-, to We are, yes. Pumps. That's good. Okay, good report. Yes. Okay, uh, any other board comment? Uh, public comment. Valerie, please. I think she missed the boat. Um, okay. I think this is approval. Yes. So we need a motion and a second. I'd move approval. Second. Roll call. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Kohler. Aye. Vice President Schmidt. Aye. Director Bregman. Aye. And President Russell. Aye. Um, okay. Uh, hold on, uh, President Russell, I think Valerie, Valerie, are you able to speak now? Um, I, I, uh, finally, the unmute jumped up on the dashboard. Are you hearing me now? Here yes, ma'am. Oh, man. Okay. I've been trying all evening. <laughs> I've gotten kicked out of this Zoom about uh, eight times. I've recome in. All right. So may I speak uh, in the open time session that I wanted to speak on? Can I do that now? Because I've been waiting this whole time. Why don't, why don't you let us complete the um, this item, and then we'll no squeeze problem. you in. No problem. Just hang, just hang on. Just hang on. I'm here. We'll give you a second. I'm okay. not going anywhere. Cool. <laughs> okay. Hope you don't get bumped off again. <laughs> Roll call. <laughs> Director Roll call. Gibson. Aye. Director Kohler. Yeah. <laughs> Vice, <laughs> Vice President <laughs> Schmidt. Aye, sorry. No problem. Aye. Director Bragman. Aye. And uh, President Russell. Aye. Now we can talk to Valerie. Okay, thank you very much. I, I really appreciated the discussion, uh, although I, of course, I was rather disjointed on this end um, about uh, what happened with those fires. And it was very distressing to me to find out that there'd been three fires this month. I wanted to congratulate Peter Anderson, who told me about this whole thing. And um, it's an email I, I, I forwarded to almost 400 people in Marin. So I think people have a lot of, I just think it's time that you guys get the support you need to get the Rangers on the watershed. And, and I think unless people know how dangerous it's becoming, um, I don't think a lot of people understand that you basically never ever see a Ranger in the watershed N -n anywhere you go. You know, you might see the trucks, but you don't see anybody walking around. And uh, I'm really concerned about this. I know I brought it up at many meetings myself, and uh, but I just really want to say, I, thought, I think the part of the meeting I heard tonight was really great. Larry uh, Brackman, again, you made many uh, really interesting and helpful comments. I really appreciate it so much. Um, and I really hope that 
when you do some sort of outreach, perhaps you could take the points that were made and, and somehow get them out maybe on next door or whatever, because a lot of really good points were made tonight. And it would be really great to see them enumerated so that people could really understand what we're facing here. Because I think a lot of people, they just are sort of living in their houses now. I mean, there are a lot of people who are really not getting out that much anymore, unfortunately. And uh, I'm concerned, especially about, of course, development, because clearly, um, you know, the roads in Fairfax, I don't even know how you would get vehicles in and out the way things are set up right now. And, and with the traffic, and adding more homes and the amount of water we have. I mean, I can't imagine that we would use our valuable drinking water to put out fires and then have nothing to drink. I mean, I think we're kind of looking at that right now. And this, it, and it just doesn't feel, um, you're not responsible for the weather. Um, whoever is should be uh, thinking a little bit better, but I don't know what to do about that either. So uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. There are no further public comments. Okay, great. Could we uh, have the water supply assessment update? Yes, good evening. Uh, Paul Sellier, Water Resources Director. I have a, just a brief update tonight on uh, the strategic water supply uh, assessment that we're doing. So we'll, we're just taking stock tonight of kind of where we're at, just pop our heads up for a minute and, and take a breather. Um, and, and look at where we are to date in this project. So far, we, and tonight we'll just briefly step through the work that we've done, which is largely surrounding these three areas of demand, the hydrology, and the model itself. <clears throat> and we'll just touch very lightly on the, the draft scenario uh, results that you saw at the last meeting before kind of closing um, with the schedule. And if you remember at the last meeting, um, there was some discussion around whether we could get through water supply options in one meeting. And so we've had a look at the schedule and I think this will, will accommodate us a little bit better in that regard. <clears throat> so re regarding demand, I know there's a lot of numbers on this table, uh, but the, the, I, I did wanna show you, this is essentially a, a table out of the urban water management plan. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when we look at the first, rectangle that's kind of highlighted here. This is our, our total uh, demand starting with our baseline, which is our average uh, three-year average demand of 24,733 acre feet. And then using um, population numbers from, from ABAG, which is what, what the Urban Water Management Plan uses, it escalates out through 2045, which is our planning period. When we, um, when we add in the conservation savings over that period of time, this second rectangle here shows us in, in 2045, roughly what we're expecting in terms of total demand. So it's, it's holding pretty, pretty constant over this period of time, although you'll see you know, it goes up and then it drops down a little bit. Um, and part of that just has to do with the population. As you know, uh, since we published the urban water management plan, um, the regional housing needs assessment was sort of dropped in everybody's lap and we're trying to struggle with how we would accommodate that. And since this assessment is really, you know, demand is a key part of it, we wanted to make sure that we did include the regional housing needs assessment that was um, sort of allocated to Marin. So we took that, those numbers of units and uh, based on the sort of average uh, residency rate that we have in Marin of about 2.3 or 2.4 persons per unit, we came up with a, a, a population number that you see in the second to last line here. <clears throat> and th this, this regional housing needs assessment kind of key on a date of 2030. So they, they, they only go through 2030. So you'll see this increase in population of almost 16, 17,000 people between where we are today uh, and 2030. After that point, we just sort of resume a traditional growth pattern for Marin, uh, which is a very low percentage growth rate. Um, when we factor in uh, those additional people, um, you can see the effect on, on the bottom line here for total water demand. So right now we'd be projecting, including conservation savings, a total demand of about 27,400 acre feet of water uh, if all of those units and were, were 
were constructed and all of them were filled at the average residential rate. Um, we have, uh, in terms of hydrology, we've availed ourselves of paleo records. And, and what I mean by that is this idea that you, you can use these geologic and sort of biologic um, evidence that's preserved in whether it's tree rings or ice sheets and, and that sort of a thing. And the scientists are able to help reconstruct the past uh, climate. <clears throat> of course, historic records form part of the database that we use as well. An example of a good one is the district rainfall data that goes back to about 1879. Other historical records around stream flows and things like that in the Russian River and in, in our local rivers as well. In climate models, we, we talk about using climate models to help predict what the future uh, hydrology might be like. And what are, these are really just mathematical sort of equations that are put together to characterize how, you know, how energy and matter um, uh, behave and interact over the ocean, in the atmosphere, and in the land. And these models essentially, they don't predict the exact weather patterns, but they're trying to understand how things may change away from what we consider to be the averages that we see today. And it, sort of a good example of that is when Armin presented this chart, which just briefly, uh, any, any dots above this horizontal line indicate uh, that they're, they're warmer than the average and any dots below represent uh, uh, water years that are cooler than the average temperature. And similarly to the left of the vertical line, you would be uh, considered drier than average and to the right, um, uh, cooler than average. <clears throat> so when we, this is our historic data. And so when we take this data and we, we look at climate models, we can see that that pattern changes. And most of the dots now are above the line indicating that it, they're, they're gonna be warmer and there are more dots occurring out here uh, to the left indicating drier. So warmer, drier conditions is what the climate models are showing us. And when we try to look at that information again, this is a historic stream flows, uh, stream flow deficits in the Russian River. Um, we do see, um, you know, these lengthy droughts like the one that in, in 1950, uh, but also in, in 1992, but also these short term droughts of record in 2021 and, and 1977. So we know those occurred, we have those records. And when we look at the climate models <clears throat> shown in blue and green here, they also show that it seems very likely that we're gonna see similar, maybe slightly deeper droughts of that nature. So with that, we've created, uh, come up with, with this, these scenarios around uh, demand and, and hydrology. <clears throat> and the first scenario, we're still playing with the names. These are very much still, draft in that respect, but it's referring to it as high demand because essentially it is, it's the highest demand, it has the lowest conservation factor. So it's taking sort of that full population loading and just people are just using water without much in the way of conservation occurring. The other part of that scenario is a very severe two year drought. Um, in this case, it's a historic drought from 1976 to 77. Scenario two, um, accelerated con conservation, We'll probably change the name to something a little more meaningful, but it's sort of um, taking a, a reasonable conservation plan, both passive and active, and coupling it with that same two-year drought to see what the effects are there. Scenario three is the, the sort of short and severe. This is the, the four-year drought that's never actually occurred, um, but does seem like it would be plausible that it could occur. And we've used uh, 76, 77, and, and 2020 and 2021 as the representative hydrology for that four year drought. <clears throat> and then scenario four is beyond the drought of record. These are the longer droughts that we saw those deeper lines on the prior chart. And scenario five, looking at the abrupt disruption. Um, and so th those, um, those scenarios, and, and before we get into looking at them, we did sort of establish uh, and look at establishing and define sort of what we feel is an acceptable minimum level of storage. This is the notion of an operational or emergency reserve. Um, and given that the first, uh, you know, say 5,000 feet of acre feet of water in the reservoir system is inaccessible and, and um, we, we just wouldn't be able to get at it. And that the, the next 5,000 acre feet or so is kind of, questionable. We've never operated the reservoirs um, below that level. <clears throat> and then 
um, above that, we would want to have some kind of a buffer in case you know our predictions of how long droughts might last it, were longer if it was an extra six months or an extra year of drought. Um, so an operational reserve, giving us this sort of 25 to 30,000 acre foot of, of, of uh, storage in the reservoir system that we wouldn't want to go below. So then we took the, the hydrology and, and demand um, <clears throat> and put that into the model. And the model is going to help us um, test the performance of the, the, the water system. Um, and so briefly just taking a look at this, this is one of the scenario number three. So this is the extreme sort of short, very short, very severe drought um, of, of 2020 and 2021, followed by 1976 and 77. And you can see the effect on on the storage levels here, we're well below 10,000 acre feet um, and well below 30,000 acre feet for, I mean, these are on the scale of years uh, on the bottom here. Uh, so just bear in mind that the, the, the deficit here is occurring over a period of, of a couple of years. Um, so then another type of drought, this would be sort of the longer term drought where we don't actually necessarily empty the reservoir system, but you can see that it, it for, several years from 24 all the way out to 44, here 20 years here, where we're sort of dipping in and out of that uh, 30,000 acre foot level. And this is a climate projection uh, using one, one of the climate projection models. And so this would be a fairly stressful time for the agency as we, we kind of go in and out of drought and conservation, different levels of savings that we're asking our customers to do uh, would be changing sort of almost seasonally. Uh, it'd be a very challenging time. So this table uh, just, I'm not gonna go through it all, but it summarizes the, the extent of the deficits, which is this final column over here. So just in, in terms of the column, here's the duration of the deficit. This is what sort of the peak of the deficit is. And when we talk about shortage, that's anything below that 10,000 acre foot line in the reservoir system that we just can't get out of the, out, we don't think and there's some uncertainty as to whether we'd be able to access all of that. So that translates into sort of annual deficits over here. And these are given in ranges um, you know, just uh, based on whether it's a 25,000 acre foot operational storage reserve or whether it's a 30,000. Um, so you can see the ranges here uh, go pretty much anywhere from a few thousand acre feet up to the tens of thousands of acre feet. Uh, shown just in, in chart form here with the, the blue representing the storage threshold at 25,000 and the orange at, at 30. Jumping then to the sort of the, the schedule before we close tonight. So the next um, meeting we'll have is June 28th. And this will be our initial look in, at the sort of detail of the water management options. Uh, so this is where we'll get a preview into the cost per acre foot and a brief description of each of the items. And we're not going to ask you to, you know, take notes and try to remember everything based on one uh, three hour presentation. So we're, we're going to go through it very quickly and it is just the initial review. And then at subsequent meetings uh, on July 12th, we'll have members of the project team available to go through in some more detail the desalination and recycled water options. And then July 19th, um, we'll, we'll take a look at Interties, uh, local supply enhancements, and, and the Sonoma options. Uh, we're hoping in July to squeeze in a public workshop so we can continue to bring the public along with us as we develop these, uh, these uh, supply alternatives. And then in August, we'll be um, uh, taking a look at, at really having described and understood these, these water management alternatives. We'll be be delving into the evaluation of them. So which of these really suits um, what we think is the, you know, the most robust set of solutions for us at the right cost. And we'll be continuing that discussion throughout August. And um, the schedule, we're only taking the schedule out through August, but we're hoping at that point, we'll be able to have another public workshop to bring the public along and allow them access to the, to the, to the project team to really get any of their questions answered about the evaluation process. Um, so that's what we have for the next couple months in terms of the strategic water supply assessment. 
And that's the end of the presentation tonight. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you, Paul. Questions? Just a clarification. Um, so it, it's, it's true to say that we are currently not simply relying on historical precipitation patterns to predict the future. Isn't that correct? Correct. So we're using different scenarios based on weather data and other factors that take into effect climate change. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Okay, yeah. I, just, I, I just want the record to reflect that fact and uh, appreciate the clarification. Yeah, with the caveat obviously being we don't have real data. So, you know, we're doing our best. Any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public? Yes, we have two, uh, Clayton Smith and then Phil Sauter. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. At the risk of appearing to be a conspiracy theorist, I think it's becoming uh, widely understood that we're in an in a environment of geoengineering, that the weather that we're actually seeing out here may not be natural at all. In fact, it may be being produced for us by all the aerosols that are being sprayed in our atmosphere uh, continually. And I think it's uh, long past uh, the time when one can, can uh, credibly live in denial of the fact that we are being subjected to geoengineering in the atmosphere. And I think well, we, for those of us who have friends in other parts of the country, what it appears has happened is that the, uh, uh, the stream of water moisture that is coming off the Pacific has been kind of shifted to eastward. Uh, we're having back here um, very little precipitation, except on occasions where we have these sudden bursts, uh, just enough to fill the reservoirs and keep us going a little further. Meanwhile, back east, they're having rain, 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 floods in Miami. And every time I look at the Apple weather uh, map, uh, I notice that my friends back east, it's raining every single day, if not every day, every other day. And um, so I think I've asked the Board of Supervisors about this. And I think since this is a, your primary responsibility, it should be the task of someone on your board uh, to um, get in touch with whoever is at the Defense Advanced Applied Research Project Association, otherwise known as DARPA, and get them to um, fess up to what's going on. What are they spraying? And um, what effect is it having on us? And we, can we have a heads up? If they're engineering our weather, uh, we should uh, be able to then be able to plan for the future a little bit better. And I also think I'd like you to do some samples of the water in the, um, in the soil and in the reservoir to see what might actually be in there. Is the barium and aluminum oxides that are being reported up north uh, in the um, soil and water actually also occurring down here? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Sauter, please. Uh, yes. I. Um... I'm grateful for the for the uh, tables, and I've done quick screenshots of them. I'm going to try to spend some time with them. But one thing I'm noticing under the the savings or the or the the the, the gallons per day, I'm noticing a baseline of 115 gallons uh, per capita per day, and I'm seeing that going down about it looks like maybe 10 percent or 8 percent by 2045. And I'm trying to understand how that 8% decrease over the next 20 years uh, correlates with the, the language I was hearing some months ago about a 40% long-term reduction through conservation. I really think that we need to start looking at um, some long-term numbers that are higher than we're looking at in terms of conservation. 
and specifically dig into some of the information that we already have available to us. I believe the district has about nine gravity systems, which represent probably nine different ways of using water uh, throughout the district. I'd like to see some of that analysis. I'd, I'd like to see, I, I think you call it an extreme conservation. I, I don't know what word I'd use, maybe just full out pedal to the metal conservation. What could we possibly do? How much could we understand about how we're using water? How could we actually look for something like a 40% decrease? Where would we find it? What would we need to do? And, and I don't see that in any of these forecast numbers, and I really would love to. And, and I'm, I guess I'm gonna keep trying to get the data and keep trying to do the analyses, but I don't think we're gonna have the luxury of, of, of reducing our consumption by 10% over 20 years. I think we're gonna be forced into, into stronger steps than that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sauter. And just like letting you know and the public know our um, slides from tonight are, are on our website. Thank you. Thanks. There are no further comments. Okay, thank you. So future meetings. Thank you. Um, just uh, reminding the board uh, on Thursday, we'll have our finance and administration committee meeting this Thursday at 930. And then next week we'll have uh, three meetings, one internal meeting, which is the, right. um, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, which is the board of directors special meeting strategic water supply assessment working session five. Mm -hmm. And then also the North Bay water reuse authority board meeting is Monday, June 27th. And July 1st is the North Bay watershed association meeting. And then we'll have our regular board of directors meeting on July 5th. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. So we need to adjourn this one or how are we gonna do this in closed session? We are going to convene to closed session um, unless there are comment, public comments on the closed session. Oh, are we gonna to stay on, the on this Zoom? No, okay. Yes. Okay, so then we have an open session, right? Yes. Um, and then we'll, we'll come back after the closed session to make any announcements necessary. No, but it says, it says there's an open session for the closed session. Just, just, we just have to reconvene to make any announcements. Okay. Yes, and we'll, we'll do that. But we're gonna ask um, our attendees to, um, step out of the Zoom for the time being and so we can go into our closed session. So all of our um, attendees who are on with us now, um, thank you. Um, we'll be doing a report out. It will be in the minutes and it will also be recorded. Um, you can come back in, but we don't have a way of letting people know and that will be, be um, much later tonight, but we'll have to ask everybody to step out. For now, uh, on, on on the second meeting, Monty, on yes. the second meeting, not the first one. Yeah. Okay, we are back on um, in recording with the attendance open. Whenever you so, is like it is it my time or or your local time, time, President? My Mr. time. Okay, well, then the meeting was adjourned at twelve fifty seven a.m. in Washington D.C. <laughs> we'll and convert no, that to Pacific time. <laughs> no reportable action. That's what I was asking you. Okay. okay. I thought you meant Thank your you. time to make the announcement. <laughs> no, no. Then we'll make it. It was 9.57 Pacific Daylight Time. Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. Have, Have a good day. night. Okay. Thank Have you. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye. Okay. Good night. All right. Thanks. Bye.